Oh, it says, can I have that back, please? <laughs> that's yours. That's yours. I think that's, that's mine. mine, yes. Well, after an, after an introduction like that, I'm really curious to what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would like to take you on board Cambria. And, and um, I was thinking, what's the best comparison? In the end, she, she is not much different from what you're used to sailing. It's the usual length minus freeboard plus 2D plus the square root of the sail area divided by 2.37. In your case, it's an 8 or a 12 or a 6. This is 23. So it's an international rule boat. It is like a 6 meter. And when you see the pictures, just imagine it's a 6 meter under a magnifying glass. She was built in 1928, built and designed by William Fife. Um, and at that time, the Americans and the British had not agreed yet for the America's Cup on what boats to go sail until Mr. Lipton came along and said it has to be J-Class. So they built two of these boats and then basically they were redundant two years after. Um, but, you know, that's sailing. Um, the, the good part or what makes Cambria extraordinary special for me, I, I've just... How do you say this? I've just been really lucky that I've been on the crew sailing regattas on this boat for 15 years now. Um, a, a wonderful team on a really special boat, and to my mind, she's one of the most extraordinary, beautiful boats afloat in the world. Um, I can't start the story really without having a short mention to her owner, who he bought the boat, as I am told. He saw her, asked everybody to leave him alone for 15 minutes, and after a quarter of an hour, he said, I'll have her. No survey, no nothing, but he knew he, what he was getting into, and you will see what he got into. He never shied away from a challenge, and for him it was his turn to do something extraordinary for an extraordinary boat. Um, the boat's 92 years old, but she never missed a season. She has raced every single season of her life. That's something different, especially for a boat of this size, where a lot of them ended up in a mud berth, or just abandoned, or just you know, run out of money, run out of time, wars came along. Not this boat. And to my mind, she's the only one that hasn't skipped a season for 92 years. I think it tells you something about the boat as well. It's, you know, she's, I think she's really pretty, and if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but these big, these big boats, uh, um, they require maintenance, just as much as any one of our boats require maintenance, and if you push them hard, and she's been sailing around the world, sailing regattas, cruising, um, her youth has changed in the beginning, you know, she was a full-on race boat, I think the next picture, yes, I need to look there, sorry, but here's uh, she racing against Shamrock and Candida in 1930, um, but then the rule changed, and basically she was no longer hyper-competitive, um, and these boats were like Oh, if you want to put a comparison down, this, the, these boats were the Comanches and the, you know, the, the, the Super Maxis of, of those days. Um, and in, in 34, 35, she changed the purpose and became a boat to be used for cruising. And she'd cruise Turkey and ended up down in Australia, New Zealand, and but kept on sailing, always did. Every 20, 25 years, these boats need a big job. And it is, I'll show you a few pictures of what that means. Um, where are we? Just to give you a little bit of an idea of the scale, again, it's, it's as I said, it's just a big six meter. Uh, the, the mast is 50 meter tall, um, and when we have a spin anchor, the spin anchor is 985 square meter, then we have a mainsail of 450 and a stay sail, so you have about one and a half thousand square meter sail on the boat. A lot of power, and, and you need a pretty good disciplined gang to sail them. The, the, the loads are phenomenal. It's, it's not just get a few guys and sail away. You, ne you need to know what you're doing. There's very little rotation in the crew. Um, um, if I look back, oh, 75% of the race crew that we have has been on the boat for 10 years or more. And uh, um, there's more on that. But if you talk about uh, uh, joy and beauty, I, I think this is as good as it gets. <laughs> Um, there's two things I would like to, to, to show you a little bit. Is, uh, uh, one is we, we had to build a new mast for the boat. The old mast was half carbon, half wood. 
Um, we couldn't race competitively with it in the Mediterranean under the rules that were there, um, plus that the carbon fiber was just plain bad for the boat. It was so rigid that it was damaging the boat. Th these are all projects which take a lot of time to prepare and uh, um, I've, I've put a little timeline in where um, the first discussions to look at building a new spar were in 2003. Um, you know, we literally found the tree to build it from, which um, I think is on the next slide. We'll see that. Um, it takes a year to, to, or two years to actually get the wood from Alaska over to the yard and a year to build it. And to put it a little bit in perspective, this is only the mast. Well, building one of these masts costs 5,000 hours. Building a new six meter is four and a half thousand hours. And that's a complete boat and this is just a mast. But you'll see they are like a work of art. The scale is pretty staggering and, you know, you need 320 kilo of glue, just the glue to put that mass together and um, you'll, you'll see it. So here we are, um, that's, uh, that's her on the, the delivery race to Saint-Tropez. You can see that's the actual tree that uh, we found for um, the, the mast and the mill in Alaska, which I have the bragging rights of actually saying the wood in this piano um, <clears throat> comes from my mill in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> this is ugly, ugly sales pitch, but if at some points you see a really pretty piece of wood going on the slideshow, somebody needs to say, where did you get that wood? And it sort of helps me to write this trip off as a tax thing. <laughs> All right, good. We're going to um, um, go quickly through on how you build a 50 meter long mast. Um, a, you need a proper design and uh, we had two people who helped us with the design. Um, Harry Spencer from Cows, that maybe some of you have met him or not, but he was one incredible character with an encyclopedic knowledge and a sense of humor that I don't know how to explain it. And the other one was Theo Rye, who unfortunately is, is no longer with us. Um, and uh, they had a, an absolute key role in, in helping us to figure out how on earth are you going to build a mast of this size. There was no yard, there was no spar builder, there was no professional company in Europe at that time willing to accept the project. It had nothing to do with money, nobody knew how to do it. To build that big, nobody wanted to take the responsibility. Um, and we, when I say we, it, we is not fair, it's they. I am only like a 2% of the whole thing. It, the, the rest is you know, Chris and Dave and the whole team. But one of the things where we started, if you want to build and rebuild a boat of this size and nobody's done it before, then try and figure out how the guys did it who did it before. And William Fife in Scotland, for him, this was a routine job. Sure, it was a big boat, but he did it a hundred times before. So if you want to figure it out how to do it, you know, use that boat as a time machine and look what happened in those days when they were building them, you know, side by side. You know, you would put an order down for a boat like Cambria, 40 meter long. You talk to the yard and the designer. Sure enough, five months later, your boat goes in the water. That's how long it took. You know, it, it, the, the pace with which they were turning out these huge boats were phenomenal. By studying the plans and the photographs and the yard correspondence of those days, that's how you learn to do these type of projects. Um, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit random through, otherwise I'm already running over time, I think or not. So um, we had to do test runs. We did trials on the actual adhesives that we could use, got the universities involved to do delamination tests. Um, we had to figure out how to build clamps um, we needed to make sure that we had the proper clamping, so we made, you know, mathematical models on how many clamps do we need, what is the torque that is required to tension these clamps, what's the distance between the clamps, kept a temperature ratio. Um, if you look at the size of the mast, it is fore and aft is about 600 millimeter, 60 centimeter, transverse is 40, and the wall of this mast, 50 meter high, is only 70 millimeter thick, you know, three inch. Um, that looks thin but or thick, but it is super thin. <laughs> Here's a, a test run when we're trying to glue. Um, how do you move a 50 meter long plank? Well, you just need a lot of people. Um, so, you know, you lit literally, uh, um, when every work was prepared, 
the guys basically would go to the pub and empty the pub and say, we need help, and everyone's going to get a beer by the time it's done. And you just line up 25 people and said, here's a brush, put glue on, because there's that only that much time to put the glue on, there's only that much time to close the joint, and only that much time to apply pressure. Just need lots of people. The pub is great for that. <laughs> Here, here's one of the, uh, which I wish I had a pointer. Um, if you build a hollow mast, you can't just go from hollow to solid. You know, you get what they call a stress path. You know, there's loads on the mast, and if you go from hollow to solid in one straight go, that's exactly where the mast is going to break. So somehow you need to ease into the solid and ease out of the solid into the hollow again. And it's pretty simple with a small mast, but here it's almost that section is like building a boat. And on, on the uh, on the right picture, that's where you see Chris chiseling it out. Um, and this is how it looks like. And th this, the size of where you are going into the hollow and, and to the solid, any one of us could just lie down there and just, you know, it's, it's the size of, you know, a tight, but it's a, about the size of the bunk that we sleep in. Here we have a look inside the mast. Um, as you see, it, it, there's no epoxy treating or, or two component. Everything is the old fashioned way, which we've all felt was the, the right way to do it at the time and still do. Um, if you want to build something of quality, I think it is just as important to spend a lot of time on the things you don't see as the things you see. And I think this is a good example where you look inside the mast and again, you know, you can just lie down in this mast. But the quality of the workmanship inside the mast is impeccable. And no one will ever see it again. That was just a short glimpse in time. But it does prove on how you properly built and the attention to detail. Here we are closing her up. And this is where the real work starts. It's not entirely true. There's always something done. Now you need to round her. Um, <clears throat> you know, the mast is tapered rounded, you need to scribe them, I'll spare you the detail, but this is roughly where it's happening. It's pretty depressing when you take your hand planer and have to chisel, but it's, it's literally, it's just people and time and people who know what they're doing. And then once you've rounded the mast, you've got to sand her. And, and you know, the name longboarding gets a different meaning when you have to sand over 150 foot length. But this is, by the way, someone needs to say, what a beautiful piece of wood. You'll get a free beer if you do. <laughs> okay, you got the beer, thanks. <laughs> okay, so now we're, we're, uh, we're, we've got the mass round, and now we need to drill the holes. And again, if you, you know, the holes for the fittings and the hounds and the tanks, you don't just scribe them on. They need to be drilled with the utmost accuracy. Um, reason for that accuracy is alignment. If you, the, the, she has rod rigging, her rods are about 33 millimeter thick. The loads on, if you look at the compression load in a spar like this, is around 65 to 70 ton static. So that's the load on the mast foot. It's also the strain that we have on the shroud. So if one of those shrouds is not properly aligned, if one is higher than the other, or drilled one millimeter out of line, then basically what we're doing is retorting or we're skewing the mast um, and putting undue pressure on. So this has been, you know, one of the, it looks primitive what we're doing, but it's, it's been, to my mind, a work of art. Um, what a beautiful piece of work. Oh, thank you. Another beer. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, and then underneath, uh, the, one of the, the important things when you're putting a, a, a mass together is uh, what do you do underneath the fittings, underneath the hardware? If you look at where a lot of the masts, older masts go is because they've put some kind of two component jelly underneath the hardware and lock up the moisture and exactly that's where the mass is going to break. And this was one of the things where Chris sort of said, if we want to know how we do it, let's do it. I like the man did it, who did it a hundred times before red lead. You can't buy red lead, go on the internet, find the recipe, mix it and don't tell your mom. That's the long and short of it. And I, I still believe that is the right recipe. Um, maybe not the popular choice, but it's really, I, I believe it's really good. Here's uh, 
Chris putting the, the, the tanks on and now we're almost ready. That's the mast as it is going out of the shed. You've seen this slide before. Okay, so we have a new mast. Just to give you an idea, the old mast was, because uh, um, she was converted in 1974 to a catch, and then John David decided for the America's Cup Jubilee to make her original rig again. So he used the mizzen mast as a boom and got Harry to extend the mast to the original height with carbon fiber. That didn't really work. The mast weighed about three and a half ton. The new wooden mast is actually 500 kilo lighter and stands really, really well. And we've been sailing with her now for 14 years, 15 years, and stands as proud as the team who built it. Okay, so now we have a new mast, and then uh, I've, I've, I'm going to skip the systems refit. That's something else. The boat had to have new tanks, and, and you know, the whole interior came out. Um, but one of the worry things for everybody who had something to do with the boat is that she was glassed over. And that happened um, um, 30 years ago. And nobody really knew what was underneath. And we, I mean, I think it's a popular opinion in Finland too, is that once you actually glass over a boat, that's the end of it. Um, I think luckily is that when Cambria was glassed over and, and sheathed, the owner had the wisdom and the means to not use polyester, but to use epoxy. And I still was you know, horrified with the idea of taking it off, but there was no choice. Nobody knew what was going to look, find what we would find underneath, but as you will see, it's actually better than we thought it was. Um, again, the projects of this scale, and, and you got to remember that the owner had the very strong desire to make sure you don't break with the tradition of Cambria and that is sail the boat every year. So whatever happens, any project that we went on, he had to sail the boat. And so what normal people would do is say, let's put the thing on the hard terror apart and three years later we've got a brand new boat and she goes back in the water, not Cambria, got to sail. It actually gives you the opportunity to study and see how you're going to approach it. And if I remember rightly, um, um, start the first discussions about partial replanking, getting rid of the fiberglass five years before the project. So the first thing we did, as soon as we sort of had an idea roughly, and when I say we, it's Chris and Dave and all the others, not me, um, is to figure out um, how much wood we needed. And we needed some mahogany, so I had to find a tree. So. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, so it's three beers. <laughs> um, just, it, it's, it's, I, I think that was the luck for me. I, I do the purchasing of the mahogany for that company that builds the piano, so I have access to extraordinary mahogany, and uh, they, they helped us source the right wood for the project, but it was pretty extraordinary. These boards are one meter wide, nine meter long, flawless, and it was exactly what we needed for Cambria. At the same time, if you look, the, the, the desire was also to rebuild her according to the original specification, which meant that underwater she had to be teak, above the water she had to be mahogany. Where do you find nine meter long teak? Well, we found it. It took two and a half years. And uh, um, here's Chris and Dave and their seal of approval. <laughs> um, where are we now? Good. So fast forward, we're in the yard and uh, time, to, time to put the boat on the dry and tear her apart. Um, how do you take a rudder off of that size? I mean, the next, if you, you actually have a look, and I wish I had a pointer, but you see where the chain goes through in all the old big boats, the biggest trouble is how do you control that rudder as it comes down? It looks simple, but the thing is huge. Um, so there's a sacrificial block in there, which you ram out and you put a chain through and you put a block and tackle of three ton and you lower the rudder. That's why you study the old drawings. That's why they are vital that we have access to them. That's why it's good that Violetta is helping us to find those drawings and list the archives. Where can we find the information to rebuild these boats the way they were? Okay, rudder is down. Here comes the joy. This is the, the next picture is the joyful job. That, that, <laughs> okay, fiberglass off. So this was a job that took, I think it was Oh, it was a month for six people in total or so. It was huge, basically just chiseling off bit by bit all the fiberglass that was on the boat. It was done manually by just driving wedges in. Um, 
Yeah, she's pretty big, so you need big lifts for people to go up and down. And, um, and you know, it's not the world's nicest job to do, but it's got to be done. Um, one of the good things, if any of you ever has a boat that needs to get rid of the fiberglass that's around it, um, we used osmosis planers. You know, in the time that we had the osmosis sickness in the fiberglass boats, they developed a planer where you could just sort of shave off parts of the polyester hull. That's exactly the way we did it with Cambria. For the most important reason was that we wanted to save the planks that were underneath. We didn't know exactly what we're heading into. We thought we did. But if we could save them, they were going to be saved. Like it wasn't going to just let's replank the boat and get it over with. No, we had to reuse as much as possible from the original material. So this is the good news. This is how that you're looking at the transom. Um, it was basically impeccable. And most of the wood was the original Honduras mahogany that William Five used in 1928. Um, one of the real surprises was for, for me was, which it's, it's, believe it or not, it's tough to admit, um, is that the, the epoxy glass actually did a good job. And I think a lot of us just want to believe that it's bad, it's not. And, and I hate myself for saying it, but it's true. Without sheaving the boat with epoxy and glass, Cambria wouldn't be here today. Simple as that. <laughs> One beer. <laughs> Half a beer. <laughs> so anyway, as we stick to go through the project, uh, um, um, you know, it, it wasn't just that we had to go through the planking, uh, uh, the keel bolts had to be pulled. She has a big keel. 75 tons of lead. It hangs on bolts which are 50 millimeter diameter. They're bronze. There's a lot of them. They haven't been out for God knows how long. So you need big seven ton presses to press them out. And then basically what was done, you can't just drop the keel on a boat of that size. So the keel bolts were dropped every second one of them. So you would have half of them would stay in. They would be x-rayed and checked and then would go back in and then you would take the other ones out and x-ray them. The interesting thing was keel bolts, 92 years old, bronze, every single one of them went back in. They were flawless, perfect. So if you take the right materials, boats can last. Okay, um, where are we going now? Right, take the interior out. I don't know if any one of you has been below deck. It actually looks pretty nice. This is what the goal was, but this is how she looks on the inside. And it's, it's really lovely. It is, it's exquisite. and and. Her interior is really the way it was 92 years ago. Most of all the joinery is 92 years old. And what is not 92 years old, basically, you know, you'll see the corner, that's the galley over there. Uh, you need to be able to cook for 28 people. Um, so, you know, Theo Rive redesigned it and basically looked at every single detail that William Five have used and only our own small, small little intimate group here right now and the people watching on Facebook know that it's not original. But if you go inside, you think it is original and that's what he did extraordinarily well. Um, the interesting thing is that Mr. Fife actually had realized that the boat might last a, bit, a little bit longer than two years and that the interior had to go out. So again, you find the old drawings and you figure out how you can dismantle the interior without damaging it. And this is a boat with a saloon and a galley and there's six crew quarters and there's four guest cabins and there's bathtubs and the da di da di da the whole shebang. Exquisitely beautifully made. But you can just take it apart. Boom. Put it inside and store it and actually reach the full inside of the hull. Um, again, research, preparation. Just don't go in with a screwdriver and a hammer. Think and ask the people who know or who might know or look at archives, museums, dive in. Prepare. So here's another one which used to be very lovely here we're in the four peak and the biggest worry on cambria was not the wood it was the steel she she was a composite boat so she was built like shamrock and many of the other big boats in those areas the full structure of the boat was built in steel and only the whole planking was wood and any any of the j-class boats were built that way um, and so was cambria and candida and shamrock and uh, sorry and uh, and astra um, and the steel is a real, 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 real worry. Here we are just moving out the tanks. Sorry. Got to watch out, I'm talking too much. Okay. Ah, that's where we organized. We had a strip club. Very important. Um, 
I can recommend it to anyone. If if you're doing a boat, you know, open a strip club. This is where it happens. That's basically you bring all the stuff that needs to be stripped and bring it to this. It is a beautiful strip. It's this is an expensive talk. This is beer number four. <laughs> Yeah. So and that was uh, there was basically three three people for more than a year. All they were doing is just stripping back paint and build you know, and varnish and just building up again. And we're going to go quickly into there. You go. Um, I think the next picture is the one I really like. It gives you a little bit of again the size, the scale of the whole project. Um, it's really easy to talk about it, but try and do it. Um, Mamma mia. There was a reason why the planks need to come off, and here we go. Um, iron sickness. So, there was water trapped in between the steelwork and the woodwork, and, and I think we all have had our own experience with mahogany and rusting steel. You know, it becomes brittle, and you can just, you know, break it like a carrot. Well, sure enough, there was plenty of that on Cambria. Um, Here's a bit more of that, um, and those those planks you really you couldn't save. No way. It's it, you know it's so far, and it's 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 not the steel that has corroded all the way through. Um, it's the wood which has corroded. On the steelwork itself, um, there was the rule of oh, I can go back. On the steelwork, there was the rule which was basically the rule by Lloyd's. Um, if eighty percent of the original thickness remains, then the steel can stay. Um, so again, Macon in Irvine got us <clears throat> all the original drawings, 120 plans from Henderson in Scotland. We've got all the, all the individual specifications of each individual frame and plate and clamp and what have you. Went through them all, knew what the original thickness was, got rid of the rust and all the dirt and what have you, measured it. Are we still within Lloyd's, you know, A18, yes or no? No, replace it, yes, clean it up, epoxy coat it and Bob's your uncle. Sounds simple, big job. Fastenings. Any normal person would say, if I take a boat apart, um, throw the fastenings away. Well, there's 5,000 of them. Um, you know, they cost about 15 euro a piece. So they're, you know, there's about 75,000 euro in fastenings alone. You can build a nice boat for that. Apart from that, there was also the wish is, can we actually keep them? Yes or no? And here's the interesting one is we, you know, as the boat was torn apart, every plank went off the boat, every single plank. Not all at the same time, you do one by one, you make sure you keep the integrity and the structure in place. Bolts came out, tested, and they all turned out the original bronze bolts were all fine and they went back in. The ones where they replaced them with stainless steel, they were discarded. Do I need to hurry up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. I'm going to cut this one short. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, it's a good thing. You should just say out loud and sort of, you know, yeah. abandon race or something. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll cut it. We're, we're still in the steel section here. Um, this is a good example of where, you know, the steelwork had to be cleaned up, grounded, ne needle guns, God would have you, it goes on and on and on. It wasn't all perfect. Some of the bolts came out like this. The stem came off, you know, the, you know, the, the horn timber came, you know, was, was shortly removed. As you said, so the rudder came off, we exposed the keel, the whole boat was basically, every single piece was inspected and came apart. 120 ton of wood and steel. Big job. These were, for instance, the original shear plates. Uh, they were fine. We could, you know, needle gun them, epoxy them and make them back in. Starting to replank. I'm just trying to keep Sampa happy here. <laughs> And uh, uh, Beer would help. just some more pictures of the steel work. There we go. There's one double shot in. Okay, here's a short one. Try to save the old planks. Normally you would discard an old plank. In this case, the, the decision was if the seams where we caulk are soft and the rest of the plank is hard, cut it off, glue a new piece on and save the old plank. That way, actually, a lot of the old planks could be saved, and rather than sort of just replanking the whole boat like most of the yards would do, save the old wood as much as you can. Okay. Glasses back on, filler, now you need to fair her, and this is longboarding, so you've got a PVC pipe with sandpaper grid 40 on and six guys, and they just sand by hand. That's an enormous boat to try and make a pretty big job. 
and it starts to look like something like this. Kadoink. And there she comes out of the shed. Ta da! That's it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. What, a, what an amazing refit, I would say. Uh, just have a one question to you. Seriously, John, how much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't answer the question for the simple reason that I never asked the question. But you believe it or not, I, in, in all the years that I've been on board, I have never, ever, ever raised the question. It never dawned to me to ask it. And, and um, it's, it's, you know, if you, it's, it's not really cheap and you can buy. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, no, you can, you can, you can buy a boat of this size. And for the same money, you would get a lovely, really nice 35, 40 meter long motor yacht with two times 6,000 horsepower, burning five, 600 liter of diesel per hour, a um, bunch of permanent crew, pretty girls in bikinis and what have you. And, and like, you'd look really good. And I think bottom line is if you have the choice between spending your money on a great big motor yacht, which you look, motor yachts longer than 35 meter at this moment. There's 400 under construction in the world. That crazy it is. 400. Hello? Huge. So here's your choice. Do you want to be... Hang on, I need to work this right. I'm sorry. Would you like to be associated with an obscene display of wealth or with a thing of extraordinary beauty? <laughs> and I think... I'll go for Cambria. <laughs> That's a good one. Thank you.